All right. So, all right. So, today we are going to talk about elastic waves. So this is a new module and we're going to start discussing phonons. However, before we are able to do that, I just wanted to present another example of the tight binding model. And the example that I would like to present today is a two dimensional example. And this is about a square lattice. So, so far we've seen 1D tight binding models. Uh, we've seen a monoatomic chain as well as a diatomic chain. For a diatomic chain, we've already seen the dispersion relationship. And figured out that the dispersion relationship contained two strings. And those strings correspond to bands. So we have a lower band and we have an upper band. And there is a band gap between the two bands. So the same scenario could also be achieved if we had two orbitals per atom. Now, today we're going to look at a two dimensional version of the tight binding model and the lattice that we now have is a square lattice. So let me draw the square lattice. Okay, here we are. So now in this particular example, we have atoms located on the intersection points of these square grid points. And each point is characterized by two indices, i and j. So this is my i axis and this is my j axis. So we place atoms on uh, these uh, intersection points. And of course, we're going to have a Hamiltonian. So first of all, let me write down the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian for the electron is a kinetic energy term and a potential energy term. And the potential energy term is characterized by these two indices, I and J. And each one of these I and Js goes from one to N1 in the case of I and N2 in the case of J. And N1 are the number of atoms along the I axis and N2 are the number of atoms along the J axis. So on each atom, we place an orbital. So this is just my cartoonic representation of the orbitals. And each orbital will now be defined by a quantum state. Let that quantum state be M1 comma N1, all right? So which is just a shorthand for M1 tensor product with N1. So M is an index that increments as we go down this grid and N1 is an index that increments as you go from left to right on this grid. So our trial wave function is simply going to be a superposition of all these M1, N1s with some coefficients. And the task of the tight binding model is to find out what these coefficients are. So now what we could do is we could have the Hamiltonian. We, we write down the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is simply the Hamiltonian acting on the wave function gives me the energy. And we want to find out these eigenstates and these eigen energies. In other words, we would like to find out these coefficients. That's what the tight binding model boils down to. So now what we could do is we could take the Hamiltonian and act it on our ANSATs, our unknown state, and then find the overlap with some arbitrary orbital. 
M2, N2. And that's what we've done in all our tight binding examples. So let's proceed forward with this case in point. Uh, let's look at the left-hand side. The left-hand side is bra M2, N2. The Hamiltonian is K plus V I J summed over all of I and J M1, N1. And I'm summing up over M1 and N1. All right. Now we already know that uh, we can break up this sum of potential energies into the potential energy on the point M1 and N1, M1, N1, and all other terms. So I is not equal to M1 and J is not equal to N1. So it's obvious that uh, when, if, if you look at this part of the Hamiltonian, the uh, M1, N1 is an eigenstate of this Hamiltonian. So it's just going to give me the energy. Let's call that energy E naught prime. The atomic energy E naught prime and then I will find the overlap of this of these two cats. I will get chronica delta M1, M2, chronica delta N1, N2. And I, of course, I need to sum up over M1 and N1 plus sum over M1 and N1, M2, N2, sum over Vij where I is not equal to M1 and J is not equal to N1 acting on cat M1, N1. All right. So this is a done deal. So this is a done deal, which means that this is going to equal to E, e naught prime By the way, there's a C M1 N1 here as well. C M1 comma N1, C M1 comma N1. This is going to give me C M2 N2 plus. Now let's look at this, this term here. If my M2 is equal to M1 and my N2 is equal to N1. This means that I'm finding out the expectation value of all the potential energies. Since I'm also summing over M1 and N1, I'm finding out the potential sum the, of the expectation value of the expectation value of the sum of all the potential energies, which arise from all the nuclei but the M1, but the one particular nucleus, which is the M1 N1 nucleus, because I is not the same as M1 and J is not the same as N1. So what this results is an offset term as we've seen in multiple examples. So I could, I could do the following. I could pick out that particular term. Let's call it V cross. And then I, since my M1 is the same as M2 and N2 is the same as N1. I write and I have a chronic delta. I just then sum over M1 and N1. I get another term of this kind. And I'm left with, with terms in which M1 is not the same as M2 and N1 is not the same as N2. The others really means that I have a term of this kind. I is not equal to M1, J is not equal to M2, uh, N1, excuse me. M1 is not equal to M2 and N1 is not equal to N2. And I'm summing over all M1, N1, and I have a M2, N2 bra here. 
and then M1, N1 bra here and C, M1, N1. Right, so I get these three terms. Is this clear or, or do you want me to repeat this? Uh, sir, it's clear. See? Uh, clear, sir. Clear, okay. So this gives me E naught prime plus V cross C M2 N2 plus sum over all M1s, N1s, bra M2 N2 V I J, where I is not the same as M1, J is not the same as N1, and M1 is not the same as M2, and N1 is not the same as N2. So this is the scheme that we have uh, applicable for all kinds of tight binding Hamiltonians. The first term, if you observe, this term simply gives me some energy. E naught prime is the atomic energy and V cross is the energy correction that happens to the atomic energy because of the presence of all other nuclei. So it's like a bias term. So E naught prime is a pure atomic energy and V cross is the energy shift that occurs because of the presence of all other nuclei inside the square lattice. So I would like to write both of these terms together in the form of E naught CM2 N2. This term, by the way, sometimes called the on-site energy in the tight binding context. So I have an on-site energy contribution and I have a contribution due to, due to possibilities of hopping, right? So M1 is not the same as M2, N1 is not the same as N2, and this is my Hamiltonian, which comprises potential energy terms. So all of this term overall represents some form of hopping. I don't know why I forget writing this. Okay. So now if we put certain constraints on the system, for example, what we argue is the following. If I go back to my square lattice. I argue that, okay, if I would like to do a hop in the vertical direction, I have some amplitude for that. Let's call that T1. And I'm saying that only nearest neighboring hops are possible. Interactions between nuclei that are adjacent to one another is possible. So I have the possibility of a vertical hop with some amplitude T1 and I have the possibility of a horizontal hop with some possibility T2. And these probabilities, these amplitudes, these are not uh, uh, probabilities per se, these are the square roots of probabilities and amplitudes these probabilities T1 in general, they're not the same as T2. They could be different or they could be the same, but let's keep the general sense that T1 is not the same as T2. So now if this is the scenario, we would like to replace this potential energy term with hopping terms. All right. Uh, and how do we do that is in the following fashion. There's a horizontal hop that's possible. So let's call this a horizontal hop. And let me, by the way, redraw the lattice again. This is my incrementing M1. This is my incrementing N1 or N2. So horizontal hop means that my M remains constant, but my N Two and N two goes up by one, or it decrements by one. So M remains constant, but the N changes. So I could replace this by Kronecker deltas, uh, in which my M remains the same, so that M one is the same as M two, but my N two could be N plus one, N one plus one. And the other possibility is that my N2 could be N minus one. 
So this term that I've written in purple represents a horizontal hop with amplitude T1. So in a horizontal hop, the M's remain the same. That's why my M1 and M2, they form a chronic delta, but my N's can increment or decrement by one. So N's can go by plus minus one. So therefore my N2 could be N1 plus one or my N2 could be N1, N1 minus one. Likewise, I have another term that accounts for the vertical hops. So T2, T2, these are my vertical hops. In vertical hops, my ends remain the same. But my M2 could be one incrementing M1 or it could be M1 decremented by one. So this is my, all of this is a matrix element of the Hamiltonian. This is the left-hand side of the time-independent Schrodinger equation projected onto some arbitrary atomic orbital. All right, and if I were to write down the right-hand side of the Schrodinger equation, which is epsilon naught, n1 comma n sorry m1 comma n1 c m1 n1 summed over m1 and n1 projected onto m2 n2 by the way this is the energy epsilon this would simply give me epsilon the total energy c m2 n2 so this is my right hand side. Now what I could do, I could equate the left hand side with the right hand side. So let me do that. So epsilon naught C M two N two plus or minus T one. By the way, <laughs> sorry, I keep on forgetting the C M one N one. C M1 N1 and I'm also summing over M1 and N1. Sorry. Minus T1 sum over M1 N1. Delta M1 M2. Delta N2 N1 plus 1 plus delta M1 M2. Delta N2 N1. 1 minus 1 c m1 n1 minus t2 sum over m1 n1 chronica delta m1 m2 sorry chronica delta n1 n2 delta m2 m1 plus 1 plus delta n1 n2 Delta M2, M1 minus 1, C M1, N1. This equals energy C M2, N2. And I could take this to the other hand, to the other side, I get E0 minus E, C M2, N2 minus T1. Now I can do a sum over M1s, N1s, and the chronic delta helps me sample particular values of M1 and N1. And I'm left with C M2 N2 minus one plus C M2, N1 is N2 plus 1 minus T2, C, M2 minus 1, N2 plus C, 
एम टू प्लस वन एन टू इक्वल जीरो सो दिस इज द एलजेब्रिक इक्वेशन दैट आई नीड टू सॉल्व ओके सो आई प्रपोज अ सोल्यूशन नाउ आई टू डायमेंशनल सिनारियो इन दिस टू डायमेंशनल सिनारियो n2 n2 minus 1 cn2 and cn2 plus 1 i'm just checking my calculation <coughs> all right so far so good so now i propose a solution of this kind c sub m comma n let's call this e i m k x a plus n k y a Where a is the lattice constant here. This is a. So I have a two-dimensional lattice. The reciprocal lattice will also be two-dimensional, and the axis will be now be characterized by k x and k y. So I have a two-dimensional wave function here, which depends upon k x and k y. So I can put this solution into the. Uh, into the scenario that we have at the top so we'll be left with so let's do the let's do it so e not minus e now remember uh, on both sides if you look at these terms here this each of these coefficients has an m2 and an n2 at least but there's an increment or a decrement of 1 with each of these indices so now since this is an exponential function if my m is replaced by m plus 1 it's going to be the the same exponential function with an additional term being multiplied which is ei some k into a so i can cancel out uh, the bare bone exponentials from both sides Uh, so this is a step that that i'm skipping from this calculation so i'll be left with minus t1 e uh, minus iota k y a plus E plus i k y a minus t two e minus i k x a plus e plus i k x a. This equals zero. All right. I hope you get this. So I've just cancelled out e i m k x a. Plus n k y a, actually m two and n two k y a from both sides. That's what I've done over here. So if I were to do that, I can easily find out what my energy is going to look like, and hence I can tell what my dispersion relationship is going to look like. So it's going to look like e minus e equals e not my on site energy, my which is just some constant, which is. depends upon the atomic energy as well as the energy due to the perturbation of all the nuclei minus some t1 which is some amplitudes it could be some positive negative number to e and i can replace this with 2 times cosine of kya minus t2 2 times cosine of kxa so this is my energy dispersion relationship and of course it's going to be two dimensional so i can plot it if i have kx here and i have ky here this result is going to look if i were to plot a contour plot it might look like ellipses so i let me let me try to plot this so now i have a two dimensional uh, dispersion relationship so in order to plot this i would like to go to mathematica So please note this note down this dispersion relationship. If 
for a square lattice in the tight point binding approximation. So now I go to Mathematica. So let me change my screen sharing protocol. Uh, so excuse me. All right, so just give me a second. <clears throat> I need to sign in. Sorry, I thought I had already signed in, but okay. <clears throat> Is there a question? All right. All right, so here is, uh, I had already created this notebook. So what I have over here is, can you see this uh, three-dimensional plot? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, so what I've done is I have just hard-coded the dispersion relationship so I have minus two times T one into cosine KX. I've taken A to be one just for arbit just some arbitrary uh, unit cell length A is one unit. Minus two times T one cosine KX minus two times T two cosine KY. And I've plotted between in the first Boulogne zone from minus pi over A to pi over A, both KX and KY. And I can adjust my T ones and my T twos. So this is what, uh, so the first variable I have is T1 and the second variable I have is T2. So I, if I were to change these parameters, the contour plot is going to change its form slightly. T1 and T2 are the hopping strengths or the exchange integrals along the two dimensions of the two dimensional lattice. And I can also express this in, in the form of a, uh, in the form of a counter plot. So let me see if I, oh, -ho. just trying to change the format of this so that I can increase the font size probably. All right, nevertheless. So this is a counter plot. And if you observe this counter plot, these are my values for T1 and T2. I change these hopping integrals. I will change the plot. <laughs> All right, so if you observe in the middle at, at the kx equals zero and ky equals zero point, which is at the center of this first Brillouin zone, I have negative values. So this really looks like a bowel. So this bowel is also seen here. And for small values of kx and ky, values which are very close to zero, I will get a bowel-shaped uh, parabolic, in fact, a parabolic pattern. And I can also look at that dispersion relationship if I were to replace kx in the vicinity of zero by one minus 
kx square a square over 2 and I replace ky by 1 minus ky square a square over 2. I will immediately find out that uh, my dispersion relationship in this region is going to start looking like ellipsoidal boils, uh, ellipsoidal bowels or cusps. So now I have a bowel shaped dispersion relationship for this two dimensional lattice. So this closes my discussion for uh, the tight binding model. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Sir, yeah. Sir we have been assuming orthogonality for while we solve the Schrodinger equation. So how, how do we know that this assumption is correct? Okay, just give me a second, please. Uh, just give me a second, please. I'm going to turn on my video somehow, so just for, for the time being. So, so I'll kiss the Many, sir. Mac one. Hadi, Hadi. Hadi. Hadi, but yeah, K. J. J. Marie Zumption and I get the orthogonality of the orbitals on the various atoms that is is an approximation and it's a good approximation if the atoms are far apart or the hopping between the atoms is small it's a small amplitude if the if the atoms get closer together the values of the hopping integrals the t values go up and this uh, assumption of orthogonality breaks down however uh, i'll probably give a homework problem that even if this orthogonality assumption is waived we we do not assume orthogonality still we would get uh, the same dispersion relationship but the derivation will be much more complicated okay so it's a good approximation only when the exchange between the different atomic sites is small and the general form of the tight binding hamiltonian is that there is an on-site energy and there's a tight binding energy oh sorry there's a hopping energy or an exchange energy and this is valid for all kinds of lattices, hexagonal lattices, three-dimensional lattices. You'll just have to find out uh, what kind of interaction is it. Is it a nearest neighbor interaction? Is it a nearest neighbor and a next to the nearest neighbor interaction? Or is it an interaction that just goes down exponentially uh, as we change the distance from an atom and so on, right? Right, thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to move to the uh, concept of elastic waves. Now, elastic waves, so far we've looked at electrons. So we started off our discussion with three electrons and had no potential whatsoever. And we got a parabolic re uh, relationship. By the way, here in the vicinity, in this tight binding model, in the vicinity of the kx equals zero and ky equals zero point, we also have a two dimensional parabola, which I'm calling a bowl. Anyway, so we started off with three electrons and we got the quantization of Ks because the solid is of a finite size. Then we immersed inside that free electron, a lattice, a periodic arrangement of ions, which produced a periodic potential. And that led to certain perturbations that led to the opening of band gaps and the departure from uh, parabolicity near the zone boundaries. <coughs> All right. Then we looked at the other extreme. The other extreme is the tight binding model in which the atoms uh, cling to their electrons to a very strong degree. And these electrons reside in orbitals and the orbitals are within the valence shell, which means that the orbitals are part of the electron. Uh, part of the atom and the electrons remain close to the atoms they remain hatched to the atoms but then we gave the slight uh, opportunity for the electrons to hop from one place to another okay so this is the other extreme the tight binding model but in all of these cases we looked at the electrons the electrons inside a solid and uh, the electrons in each case were assigned a dispersion relationship Okay, 
Now the dispersion relationship is the characteristic feature of all the electrons. It tells us, okay, if you have a particular K value, a particular wave number, what would be the energy of those electrons? Okay. Just like you have a harmonic oscillator. So these electrons are like excitations of a, of a quantum field. That is the electron field. The wave function psi is nothing but a quantum field. And uh, we can view these electrons as quasi particles. Uh, each particle has a particular momentum and a particular energy. But these are not the only kinds of particles that can exist inside the solids. Now I'm going to show you that even if you forget about the electrons, we just look at the atoms, which are, are a periodic arrangement of, uh, of structures. Now these atoms can oscillate, they can vibrate. And when they vibrate, we can also create new particles, which are called phonons. And uh, the, these phonons uh, act just like electrons. They also have a dispersion relationship. And uh, we can derive those dispersion relationships from first principles. In fact, we don't even need quantum mechanics to derive them. You can derive them from classical principles. So we so far, we focused our attention to electrons. And electrons have a particular energy dispersion relationship. Now we are focusing our attention on, on lattice oscillations or crystal oscillations to be very precise. There is no such thing as lattice oscillation. We're talking about crystal oscillations. So, so this is going to be our first foray into crystal oscillations. And these waves that are produced, they're called phonons or elastic waves. And going, we're going to use Newton's law to really uh, derive the dispersion relationship for these elastic waves. So now I have to switch off my video because I have to change the orientation of my screen uh, so that I can write. My mobile camera is not working. So that's why this slight hitch today. All right, Joe. So my controls. Stop my video. And I share my screen. Uh, stop share. I <clears throat> share my one. Over. So we'll start off our discussion with a monoatomic lattice, which is the easier case to discuss. And our focus now is on crystal oscillations. Forget about electrons for the time being. The electrons are in a league of their own. They have a dispersion relationship of their own. Their energies are different. Uh, their wave numbers are different, are in a different regime. And for these crystal oscillations, the wave numbers and the frequencies are going to be in a different regime. So now the monoatomic lattice can, of course, be modeled by uh, 1D. So we consider 1D first by a string of atoms. Each atom has a mass M and the lattice spacing is A. So we have N atoms and total length is L and L over small a as always is going to be N. So this is the nth atom, this is the N plus one atom and this is the N minus one atom. So I'm deliberately keeping this discussion together with the tight binding model because of the stark similarities uh, that you'll find between phonons or quantized crystal oscillations and the tight binding model. So that's why I use this peculiar arrangement of the course contents. So now if I look at the nth atom, the nth atom can oscillate by some amplitude xn. The n plus 1th atom can oscillate by xn plus 1. The n minus 1th atom will have some amplitude of oscillation or displacement from its equilibrium position xn minus 1 and so on. So now I can always find out the potential energy of the system. So this U is my potential energy. The potential energy. Now, uh, I can also say that I, I'll try to model these 
this chain of atoms by springs that connect the atoms and each spring has a spring constant alpha which is like a bond strength and my u is going to be one half alpha and uh, if i consider these two atoms the mutual distance between them is going to be x n plus one minus x n square but then i have to sum up over all ends so i take pairwise i i take these amplitudes these displacements in a pairwise fashion and subtract one from the other one from the other square and then sum up over all of these atoms so i hop from one atom to another and find out this pairwise distribution over and over again from the potential energy i can always find out the forces acting on the nth atom uh, i take the gradient of the potential energy at the nth atom and subtract it give, sorry give it a minus sign that will give me the force on the nth atom which is going to be equal to m d square x n d t square and if i were to do that the model that i'm going to arrive at is going to be alpha x n minus x n minus 1 plus x n minus x n plus 1. All right, so is this clear? <clears throat> All right. Oh, sir, is there a summation as well? No, this is just the force on the nth atom. Okay. There's no summation here. So I, I just take this expression and differentiate it with respect to xn. Now xn appears in two pairs. First of all, it appears here. Excuse me. It appears here. And it appears in this pair. So when I'm going around this chain from left to right, that's what this summation sign is doing. So I hop from here to here, here, here. When I reach this pair, do I first encounter Xn? Then I make another hop. I encounter Xn again. And that's the reason why we have two terms containing Xn. Okay. And if you do the algebra correct, this is what the signs are going to look like. Xn minus xn minus 1 plus xn minus xn plus 1 or some authors would for conceptual clarity like to write this in the following fashion all right so this is my force that is acting on the uh, nth atom and this is my equation of motion. <laughs> All right. So you bought some of the. Now what I do terms kis tarah se aa rahi hain x n or x n minus one or x n or x n plus one wali. Thoda sa explain kar denge ki. ठीक है. चलें करता हूं ऑल राइट सो व्हाट वी हैव सो इफ आई लुक एट दिस पोटेंशियल एनर्जी टर्म यू गो बैक टू ब्लैक कलर लेट्स फर्स्ट पार्शियल यू पार्शियल एक्स एन सो रिमेंबर दैट दिस एन इज इंक्रीमेंटिंग सो it goes from x1, x2, x3, xn minus 1, xn, xn plus 1, and so on. So I'm going to take pairs. So the first time that I encounter, uh, so I have terms 
which do not have xn. The first time I encounter an xn is when I hit upon this term. Right? The second time I encounter xn is when I hit, a, hit this term. So there are other terms which do not include an xn. Got it? Yes, sir. Got it. Thank you. So do you want me to proceed with this calculation? So I need to find out the derivative with respect to xn of all of this. So there's no xn here, so I can just ignore this. And I can, uh, if I take this first term, this half just goes away and I'm left with alpha xn minus xn minus one. Then I take the derivative of this, I get a plus one. This is, does not have xn. So it, it as far as xn is concerned, it's a constant. Plus, now I consider this term, take the derivative of xn, I still get an alpha xn plus one minus xn. Now I take the derivative of whatever is in the parenthesis. This gives me zero and this gives me a minus one. All right, so this is the same as what I've written over here. Got it, Blal? Yes, I got it. Okay. All right, so, by the way, I think I forgot to put a minus sign here. Sorry, this, this minus sign needs to be there as well. So now let me write down m d square x n over d t square equals alpha x n minus one minus x n plus x n plus one minus x n. Right, so this is what I have. I just put a minus sign with it. This is my force. Now, if I were to propose a solution, xn, now my solutions have to be uh, of the block kind. So if I propose a solution, xn equals some constant. So I forget about the constant. I write e, i, k, n, a. With this case quantized quantized in units of 2 pi over L minus omega t, since I'm also considering time dependency. So if I use this ansatz and insert it into my equation of motion, let's see what I get. On the left-hand side, I'll get minus omega square m And once again, I'm now going to ignore this term. I'm going to cancel out this term in, in a slight of hand, in, in, even in one go. So I'll get alpha, the right hand side alpha, E minus I K A minus one plus E plus I K A minus one. Okay, so this gives me alpha omega square m is alpha 2 minus 2 cosine k a is 2 alpha 1 minus cosine k a is sine square k a over 2 into 2, which is so my omega square is 4 alpha over m sine square k a over two. This is my dispersion relationship. It's only that my dispersion relationship is now in terms of omega. So dispersion relationships can be written as energy in terms of k or omega in terms of k. And if I were to find out omega in terms of k, I just take the square root of both sides. 
Now I take the positive square root because I want my omegas to be positive. So sine k a over two modulus. So this gives me two alpha over m sine k a over two. And if I were to plot this, this is my k, this is my first Brillouin zone between minus pi a and pi by a. This is going to look like a sine curve since I have amplitude here. Sorry. This can also be extended to the second Brillouin zone and so on. So this is what my dispersion relationship for the monoatomic lattice vibrations looks like. This amplitude is two alpha over m. It's proportional to the strength of the coupling between the atoms, the spring constant and inversely proportional to the square root of the mass of the atoms. And I only get one string, so one band. If I were to take this section, this section, This section, I can bring it back by 2 pi over a, and this will land up here. So I can fold back uh, the band outside the first Brillouin zone in the second Brillouin zone, bring it back into the first Brillouin zone, and so on. Likewise, I can take this thing and fold it back. I'll get, get over here. So in the extended zone scheme, this is what the dispersion relationship is going to look like. And if I focus my attention on, so these are waves inside the solid. These are elastic waves that are propagating inside the solid and they obey a certain dispersion relationship, which tells us what would be their energy for particular wavelengths. So K is just the wavelength of the wave, the inverse of the wavelength. So for small K, For small k, which means long wavelength, or if long wavelength waves would like to pass through the solid, such as in sound waves. Sound waves are passing through a solid. And by the way, this is a one-dimensional lattice. So we are only considering the possibility of oscillations parallel to the chain. So this is like a longitudinal oscillation. These are longitudinal modes of this chain of atoms. So these longitudinal modes, if I take the small k limit, I can replace sine k a over 2 by k a over 2. And omega will turn out to be proportional to k. So the dependence of omega on k in this region is linear. So it's almost linear here and almost linear in this region. I can also find out the group velocities. The group velocities can be determined by the derivative of omega with respect to k. Here the group velocity is going to be constant and then it's going to at pi over a the group velocity is going to go to zero. So if I take the derivative here it's zero. So at the zone boundaries, the group velocity goes to zero. So this is what we have for a monoatomic lattice. A monoatomic crystal oscillation. I get a dispersion relationship. I do not get any bands. I just have one band uh, because only one uh, degree of freedom is possible. And that is a longitudinal oscillation. So any questions? So let me turn on my video so that I can have some semblance of reality. So any questions, Bilal, Bakir, Hadi, Mariam, Daud, we have a full house today. <laughs> full house means one fifth of the class. In general, a question was that the phonons are 
इम्पॉर्टेंट क्यों है हमारे इलेक्ट्रॉन्स थे वो तो हमें पता है कि उन्होंने हमारी एनर्जी या चार्ज करंट कैरी करके एक एक पॉइंट दूसरे पॉइंट पे जाना है वट इज़ द इम्पोर्टेंस ऑफ फोन ऑन्स इन अ मॉडल इन All right. Any questions? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Which wall? Yes, sir. My question was that the phone on him. This important in which sense? Me? Hai? Why do we discuss phone on? Electron. We told that it has to carry current, or it carries some charge. So that's why we discuss it. The phone on is physically which kind of important? And what is the purpose? देखो मैं इस पे पूरा एक लेक्चर अगला मेरा लेक्चर फोन ऑन्स पे है लेकिन अभी लेट मी आंसर इन इन ब्रीफ हेयर द फोन ऑन्स आर आल्सो दे दीज आर एक्साइटेशंस दैट कैरी एनर्जी दे कैन बी ट्रीटेड एज क्वासी पार्टिकल्स जस्ट लाइक इलेक्ट्रॉन्स सो इलेक्ट्रॉन्स आर वेव्स फोन ऑन्स आर वेव्स एंड वी कैन हैव इंटरेक्शन बिटवीन दीज वेव्स so we can have an electron phonon interaction these phonons can interact with light as well uh, they can interact with optical photons uh, these phonons uh, can also interact with magnetism the phonons dissipate heat inside uh, a solid so uh, they result in the uh, thermal properties of materials Uh, they constitute what is uh, the specific heat capacity. There is a specific heat capacity due to electrons and a specific heat capacity due to phonons. So you put thermal energy inside a solid. The rate at which its temperature goes up is determined by specific heat capacity. So there is going to be a temp temperature elevation with the input of thermal energy, which is governed by the density of phonons. The density of states of phonons. So phonons determine elastic properties, the propagation of sound, the propagation of waves. They determine uh, other effects such as Raman spectroscopy, Brillouin light scattering. Also depends upon phonons, and of course they contribute to most of the thermal properties of materials. So they are really, really important. And any any dissipation, any decoherence that takes place in a quantum mechanical system is because that there are these Uh, intrepid particles lying around the phonons that carry away the energy and the electrons they interact with the phonons transfer their energies to the phon phonons and so on so consider an indirect band transition an indirect band transition has to be mediated by a phonon because the transition is not allowed by optical angular momentum selection rules so so phonons are are the background of all all of condensed matter physics they they are really as important as as electrons okay sir thank you all right so let, let's uh, focus our attention on the diatomic uh, uh, lattice and let's look at the quantization or, or sorry the dispersion relationship for uh, diatomic elastic waves so there's a question in this all oh, right <clears throat> diatomic but still in 1d <clears throat> you might have already come across this discussion in um, in a classical mechanics course by the way so in a diatomic lattice two kinds of atoms exist With different masses, 
And notice that we've only used the Newton's principles to look at the dispersion relationship because it's a purely classical phenomenon. We have oscillations of a string of atoms. So one atom has mass capital M, the other has mass small m. M small m. And this object will have an, uh, an amplitude of oscillation xn. This object will have uh, an amplitude of oscillation, let's call it yn. Okay. xn plus 1, yn plus 1, yn minus 1 xn minus 1. So these are deviations from equilibrium for uh, these particular atoms. Now what we could do is we could immediately write down the potential energy and we could write down the forces on each atom. So if you look at an M atom, capital M atom, and we write, the, write down the Newton's law for the nth atom with mass capital M, uh, So, so the kind of relationship that I get, I'm just going to write it down, is going to be alpha. I take a neighboring atom yn, subtract from it xn. Then I take, so first of all, I've taken this pair. Now I'm going to take this pair. This is just a shorthand way of writing down these forces. And now I would like to find out xn minus yn minus 1. But then I put a minus sign in between. Okay. This is in keeping with the discussion that we had over here. It's exactly in keeping with it. Okay, here I have a plus sign and I put minus xn and here I have just a similar arrangement. And you can also motivate this, uh, get your signs correct by noticing that yn minus xn is this displacement and xn minus yn minus 1 is this displacement. And if you want to overall look at xn, you will need to subtract the two displacements. That's why we have this minus sign. All right. So this is my equation number one. Likewise, I'll have an equation for the other atom. Small m d square y n dt square is going to be equal to alpha xn plus 1 minus yn minus yn minus xn. This is my equation number 2. Equation number 1 can also be written in this form yn <coughs> plus yn minus 1 minus 2xn. Equation number 2 can be written as alpha xn plus xn plus 1 minus 2yn. So these are my equations. And what I could now do is I could now write down uh, my trial solutions. So Xn, can you just speak up what Xn, what trial solution can I use for Xn? So I am posing a question here. Uh, sir, e to the iota omega t. Usme ko x bhi to na chahiye na? Ha, to uh, k a part we had written special. K a a ek saath kya n kitha raega? Ha, uh, idhar m aaja ga index ko n. Or y n? Maybe yehi kar de. Ha, uh, index in kar de. Because n is some variable, so n is going okay. from one to the end. So 
the only difference that i need to do is i need to have different amplitudes here because the small m and the capital m masses they will be oscillating possibly with different amplitudes but each one of them has an index n so so all the action is going to all the drama is going to lie in these amplitudes got it so now i could use these ansatz and put them into the uh, into the equation and so let me try doing that so if i look at equation number 1 so i'm left with minus omega square capital m x dot see this is the left hand side and likewise i'm going to cancel out the e i k n a term from both sides is equal to alpha <coughs> why not 1 plus e minus i k a minus 2 x not simple that's very simple likewise if i were to look at equation number 2 i will get minus omega square small m y not is alpha x not 1 plus e i k a minus 2 y not number 4 now my x not and my y not are my unknowns so i can just do a bit of reshuffling and i'm going to be left off with omega square m minus 2 alpha alpha 1 plus e minus i k a alpha 1 plus e i k a omega square small m minus 2 alpha x not y not equals 0 so this is my new equation so the two simultaneous equations can now be written in the form of a matrix equation now if i were to solve this for x not and y not which really means that i would find out the solutions of the equation of motion then i simply need to take the determinant of this <coughs> and that will and equate it to zero that will be called the correct characteristic equation for this matrix equation so i'm going to find out omega square capital m minus 2 alpha alpha 1 plus e minus i k a alpha 1 plus e i k a omega square small m minus 2 alpha i equate this to 0 so i get omega 4 mm plus 4 alpha square minus 2 alpha omega square capital m plus small m minus alpha square Alpha squared one plus cosine uh, one plus cosine k uh, or uh, one plus cosine k right one. Plus cosine k. This equals zero, so I'm left with omega four m m minus two alpha m plus m omega square plus uh, uh, let's put <clears throat> plus four alpha square minus two alpha square. Minus two alpha square cosine k a equals zero. This will give me two alpha square one minus cosine k a zero 
2 alpha m plus m omega square minus omega 4 m m right so now this becomes omega yes, 4 uh, i think one plus case okay okay uh, okay okay omega 4 minus omega square 2 alpha m plus m m m plus 2 alpha square m m 1 minus cosine k a equals 0. Now, this is a quadratic equation in omega square. So, omega square becomes 1 half of 2 alpha m plus small m m m plus minus 4 alpha square m plus m m m whole square minus 8 alpha square m m 1 minus cosine k. Now what I could do, I could just take certain things out. So I am left with alpha, omega square is alpha m plus m m m plus minus m plus m m m all square minus 2 over m m 1 minus cosine k <coughs> and omega of course is going to be the square root of this so i take all of this take the square root again and use only the positive uh, value but the, this positive and negative sign before the discriminant tells us that two branches are going to be possible so one branch is with a positive sign and the other branch is with a negative sign so if i look at this expression and i were to plot this with respect to k Let's see what I get. So I'm going to turn turn my Mathematica uh, back on. Uh, I'm going to stop my share and I'm going to reshare my internet screen. All right. So can you see my uh, Mathematica screen? Yes, sir. All right. So let me see if I can change the font size just give me a second please i need to let me correct my keyboard just give me a second please <clears throat> All right, so let me, excuse me, sorry. <coughs> All right, so what I've done here I've taken uh, my big mass to be five over two units, two and a half, small mass to be equal to one unit. I've taken the spring constant to be one unit. I've taken the lattice uh, constant to be one unit and I've defined my omega one. The omega one is the square root of the big thing that I wrote over there. And this is what it is. So I, so let me run this. So M equals five by two, small M equals one, alpha equals one a is equal to 1, omega 1 equals this. Likewise, I define my omega 2. It's the same as omega 1, but this minus sign here is replaced with the plus sign. And now I would like to plot, the, plot these uh, values. So, so, and I plot within the first Brillouin zone. 
this is what I get. Omega one is the lower curve and omega two is the upper curve. The lower curve is, is really the same as the, uh, it's similar in form and expression to the monoatomic lattice. And, and that's, uh, there's a reason for that. And the upper branch is with the positive sign uh, just before the discriminant. So what we observe here is that two branches appear. Each branch or each string is called a band and two bands are appearing and there's a band gap between the two uh, bands, the upper and the lower band. If I were to make these masses closer and closer. So instead of five by two, I have one band, which is uh, one mass, which is 50% higher than the other band. So let's see what that would result in. What kind of band structure will it cause? So here I plot it again. It causes some change, but let's, uh, oh, I have to do this again. I have to find out omega one and omega two again. All right, you will see that the band gap has closed up a little bit. The band gap has decreased. <coughs> so if the, what happens if the two masses become really equal to one another? Any ideas? The band should merge. The band will merge uh, the or they will touch. touch the boundary. The boundary touch touch Let's see. Let's see. I make this one. Mega one, I recompute to mega one. I recompute to mega two. Let's see if I plot them. You'll see that these bands are now touching one another, but uh, really what's happening. So if I, if I were to make M1 larger, small M1 larger, all right, the band is going to reappear. So it doesn't really matter which mass is larger because of the symmetry of the problem. But let's move back to the uh, one node screen and see how, let me explain this a little bit. So if I, If you look at this expression over here, let's see what happens if, uh, if I had a monoatomic lattice. So all atoms of the same kind, which means M is the same as small m. Let's call this spacing D between the atoms. Okay. So in a monoatomic lattice, if I were to plot the dispersion relationship, K omega, <clears throat> so this is going to be pi over D minus pi over D. This is the extent of the first Brillouin zone and we'll have a, a, a dispersion relationship proportional to sine k a over two okay this we've already seen for a monoatomic lattice this is my dispersion relationship and i can extend it onwards no problem now what happens is 
if I were to replace this monoatomic lattice with a diatomic lattice, I keep this, this is my D, but my unit cell has now changed from D to 2D in the direct space. So my first Brillouin zone A is going to shrink to half. So now my first Brillouin zone A is going to be bounded by these two points, which I've shown in dashed line. So it's going to be pi over 2D here and minus pi over 2D. All right. So what that uh, causes is it, it creates a new, uh, uh, it, it creates a new branch in the dispersion relationship. And we've already seen what that looks like. It, it, it looks like uh, the diatomic lattice would now cause a new branch that is appearing, which looks like this. All right. So this is the impact of a diatomic lattice. A new branch opens up and that branch is at a higher energy, at a higher omega with respect to the lower band. And there's a gap between the two branches and that gap is at E, G. All right. So any questions up till this point and we'll continue this discussion later on. But let me just point finish off this lecture by mentioning that this lower branch here is generally called the acoustic branch. And the upper branch here is called the optic branch. All right. And uh, you can always find out what these values are. So you can always find out what this value is going to be. You can always find out what this value is going to be. Just insert K equals zero into the dispersion relationship. You'll find out, you can also find out what the band gap is going to be. And probably I'll going to give this as a homework. So any questions uh, up till this point and I'll continue this discussion in the next lecture. Uh, sir, when the two masses become equal, uh, shouldn't the dispersion relationship become the same as that for a monoatomic, uh, but with uh, with half of the uh, crystal length, uh, the unit cell length? Because exactly. all we are doing that's, so that's what is happening. So if you have a monoatomic lattice, I'm showing the dispersion relationship in green. This is for a monoatomic lattice. Okay, and the the Brillouin zone, I'm going to. Uh, show in uh, in uh, yellow, it's going to be this thing in green. This is the first Brillouin zone from minus pi by d to pi by d, which is this thing, right? Yes, sir. Uh, but sir, when we have a diatomic uh, lattice and both of the masses are same, so what do you mean? That's not <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Diatomic lattice with both masses the same. Uh, it doesn't sir, make sense. Uh, when we uh, uh, limit uh, use karte hai, ke when, uh, when the other mass approaches that of the uh, first mass, ki dono, mm -hmm. jab, uh, atoms ka mass is, uh, in the limit ke wo, uh, same ho rahe hai, we still So diatomic becomes monoatomic then. Then we don't talk about diatomic. If the two masses become exactly the same, then the diatomic lattice makes a phase transition to a monoatomic lattice. And the Brillouin zone uh, then expands or dilates or you see, because in the primitive side, the primitive cell in the direct space, if you have a monoatomic lattice has smaller size. So the first Brillouin zone has a, has a longer expanse in the reciprocal space. If the two masses become equal, you get a monoatomic lattice again. It's no longer a diatomic lattice. And so the dispersion relationship totally changes. All right, sir. Uh, sir uh, I was just curious if, uh, if this is the case, so our diatomically model construct kiya, to that should also reduce to uh, a monoatomic in the limit ke jo dono masses equal. Ho exactly, it does. If you, if you put <coughs> capital M equals small m, <coughs> then uh, 
uh, you will get exactly the same dispersion relationship as for a uh, as for the monotomic lattice. The only difference is now that this one minus cosine k a will become sine square k a over two. You'll get exactly the same thing. So if uh, I put m equals small m here in here, we'll get a monoatomic lattice. All right. Uh, but sir, ये जो square root के बाहर हमारे पास plus और minus दोनों जो possible cases हैं, that gives uh, an idea कि शायद दो different uh, bands बन रहे हैं. नहीं आप इसको करके देखें. M इन दोनों को बराबर रखें. ये आपके पास 2m over m square आ जाएगा. ये भी आपके पास uh, 4 2m का square. 4m square over m4 आ जाएगा. यानी 2 over m square आ जाएगा. जब आप अंडर इसको बाहर लेके जाएंगे और ये आपके पास 2 over m square है. तो it's you get exactly the same thing as the monatomic lattice. All right, sir. Okay. All right. So, do these small acrobatics uh, as, as a do it yourself problem. Okay. Now, in the next lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to look at what happens. Why are these called acoustic branches and optic branches? And <clears throat> what is uh, what do these bands look like in the limit of small and large k's? What are the group velocities? And what happens if you have a three dimensional lattice? Uh, and then I'll also introduce the concept of phonons in a bit more detail. All right, so thank you very much. Uh, inshallah, see you on Thursday. Okay, Ji Khudafiz.